we're ready to get started. So what we're going to do is, um, I'm going to, I'm going to, I usually don't introduce folks because in the past I've read these self-laudatory things. I'm looking at those going, the Nobel Prize, the Prize for Peace in 1975, I think that was you. So I just don't want to take responsibility for other people's bragging and braggadocio. But in the case of the former presiding judge, Tom Cole, I will. <laughs> um, judge Cole is, uh, was recently at the International uh, uh, seminar on sex trafficking in Jakarta, Indonesia, and he's the author of, of a book, Losing Megan, and he's been acting in the community as a lawyer and judge for some time, and one of his innovations is the, um, the drug uh, alternatives program in Washington County. I would call um, uh, Judge Cole, and he can further introduce himself, but I, I think we're going to be dealing with a structure of, he's going to present for 20 minutes, 10 minutes questions, then um, Ms. Kula and Mr. Justice will come and do the next 30 minutes with 20 minutes, 10 minutes for questions. And then, as we all know, the uh, uh, television camera stops. And if you want to stick around for additional questions, they're welcome to. Judge Cole, would you come on up? OK, well, thank you, uh, John. It's. Uh it's always a pleasure to be here. I was here a few years ago speaking about uh, the Washington County Adult Drug Program. It's nice to be back again and uh, to talk about a uh, topic that uh, has become quite uh, in the news and quite popular in the last several years. As John mentioned, uh, I had a chance to go to Indonesia earlier this year. Let me just give you a few facts about Indonesia. Uh, it is a country with a population of 237 million people. It's uh, the fourth largest country in the world. It is the third largest democracy uh, behind India and the United States. It is the largest Muslim country in the world. Over 90% of the people who reside in Indonesia are Muslims. Jakarta, the capital, is the second largest metropolitan area in the world at uh, 28 million people. And uh, it's a nation com comprised of a thousand islands, over a thousand islands, and uh, some of those major islands are Java, Borneo, Sumatra, Papua, Timor, Sulawesi, and Bali. And uh, uh, those are just some of the islands. I remember studying about those islands when I was in high school in my geography class. Uh, let me give you uh, some statistics before I start also. And I was looking through one of those brochures, and oddly enough, uh, the statistics that I have here correspond with the statistics that uh, are in one of those brochures. So that gives me uh, uh, faith in where these numbers come from. There are 27 million slaves existing in the world today. There are 8.4 million children trapped in prostitution debt bondage, and pornography. There are 1.2 million children that have been trafficked. There are 600 to 800,000 people that are trafficked across international borders, and a majority of those are forced into commercial sex trade. There are three to 400,000, three to 400,000 of these victims are children, and of these victims, 10 to 15 clients will be serviced per day by a child trapped in prostitution. I had the chance to go over, uh, as I said earlier, in February of this year, uh, as part of a team that Compassion First uh, uh, put together uh, to put on a anti-sex trafficking conference in Manado, Indonesia. And let me just give you a little information about the organization that I went with. As I said, it's called Compassion First, and they first uh, were formed uh, in, in, in Beaverton, Oregon, as a nonprofit organization in 2007. Their goal was to uh, is to serve victims of child exploitation in Indonesia, and they do this through providing comprehensive aftercare at their center in North Sulawesi uh, Providence, or province in Indonesia, and that. Uh, Center is staffed and secured uh, 24 hours a day by both Indonesians and American expatriates. They provide counseling and holiday education for the girls that are brought out of the Indonesian sex trade and work to restore their lives so that they may, may be fully stabilized upon returning to their society. 
they work closely with the local police and prosecutors in seeking to, to understand Indonesian law and how it prosecutes human trafficking. And they've held two conferences in their region in the last couple of years. Uh, the most recent was the legal conference that I was that I participated in in February of 2013, and over 25 local prosecutors were invited to, to participate in that conference. Uh, it, it, it was just a great honor and privilege to be part of Compassion First uh, uh, conference there in February. Uh, Mike Mercer, who is the president and founder of Compassion First, uh, is the that's the only non-governmental organization that has been allowed in Indonesia uh, to serve the sex trafficking uh, industry there. And uh, Mike has done a phenomenal job of uh, uh, gathering partners uh, across the Indonesia and the United States. Uh, when we went there, we uh, started off with a meeting with the U.S. Embassy people in Jakarta. And uh, it was, I was just amazed at the, the, the partnership that Mike has forged with the U.S. Embassy there. Uh, it got out among the uh, Indonesian government, uh, government uh, people and the Americans who are living there that uh, Compassion First was putting on a conference in February. And there was all sorts of interest uh, uh, generated, not only uh, in the United States government, but also in the Indonesian government. When it was learned that uh, there was going to be a conference put on, uh, the U.S. Uh, representative for the Department of Homeland Security in Singapore uh, called Mike and asked him if he could be part of the conference. Uh, the uh, federal attorney in, with the Department of Justice in Jakarta found out about the conference and he called Mike Mercer to ask if he could be part of that conference. And, uh, there was a, there's an FBI man state, uh, stationed near Bali who also asked to be uh, part of the conference. And uh, uh, so all of those people participated in the conference along with uh, the uh, head prosecutor for the Indonesian uh, terrorist uh, organization, or anti-terrorist organization, uh, whose name was uh, Taku. And he was the individual that uh, prosecuted, I remember a few years ago, there was a bombing in Bali, and uh, he was the prosecutor that successfully prosecuted two of those people. So uh, the conference uh, that we attended lasted for uh, uh, two days. Uh, we had actually a few more prosecutors there than we thought were going to be there. And uh, the purpose of that conference was to, not for us to go there and speak at them about what we do here in America, but, but to talk with them about the issues we have as uh, people involved in the American judicial system and kind of give them examples of how we've handled some of those situations and uh, offer to answer any questions that they had for us about that. And uh, on our team, we had a Portland police officer, Detective Sergeant uh, Mike Geiger, who is currently with the Portland police. He's had two uh, stints over in Indonesia and he's also gone to Bangladesh on behalf of the Portland Police Department. We had a local lawyer uh, who was on the board of directors for Compassion First, his name is Bob Miller. And then we also had the U.S. Attorney Amanda Marshall who traveled with us over there and actually was able to put on several hours worth of uh, uh, material for the prosecutors who attended uh, that, that conference. So uh, it was, like I said, just a great honor to be part of that. Uh, before that started, we had a chance to go visit the shelter home uh, in uh, Monado. And uh, I mean, it was just an amazing, amazing place. They had uh, eight, they have a capacity of eight young girls that can be there. Eight girls were there who had recently been involved, taken out of the uh, sex trafficking industry, rescued by the local police. And uh, it was just a wonderful night to kind of just uh, look at them, to eyeball them, and to see how well they were doing. I mean, you could, do, you could tell they were doing well. Physically, they looked, they looked healthy. And uh, just a little bit of a story about the, the background of Compassion First. When Mike first went over there, as I said, they are the first and only uh, NGO that's been allowed in Indonesia to deal with this particular issue. 
their first girl that, uh, that they rescued, uh, the police and prosecutor ended up filing charges against the person who was uh, trafficking this young girl. And uh, during the course of the trial, actually things turned upside down. And this is kind of what you have to deal with in foreign countries, is that uh, the victim who was testifying at the trial suddenly found herself being turned upside down, 180 degrees, and she was charged with prostitution. So she went from a victim to a defendant in one proceeding, and uh, she was found guilty of uh, prostitution. Mike Mercer's organization ended up hiring a local lawyer to appeal that decision, and they went through that process and appealed it, and eventually got that, got that uh, reversed. But in the meantime, a lot of their money was spent uh, defending that young girl in the Court of Appeals system in Indonesia. When we were over there in February, they had just concluded a trial with uh, uh, a victim who, who was being uh, housed in a Compassion First shelter home there. And there were also two witnesses, and the witnesses were also two of the young girls were there. To show how things had changed over the last couple of years in Monado, uh, the, uh, the judges uh, who were there were actually asking questions of the witnesses, and the witnesses and the victim were allowed to have the house mom there with them in the court proceeding. And so there's been just a really neat change of, of the attitude of the local authorities in there about uh, the victims of child sex abuse. Uh, there has been no decision made yet. The, in, in Indonesia, they don't have jury trials. They have the judges only uh, make the decision. And this was a three-judge panel. So they have taken that case under consideration. And uh, there is a ruling that, that uh, will, is expected to happen here shortly. So um, that was my experience. You know, in Indonesia, I had a chance to talk a little bit about my experience here locally, too. Uh, my eyes have been open recently to the huge problem that we have here in the United States. And uh, it happened in a trial I had about uh, three or four months ago, in which a man was charged with uh, sexual abuse of a young uh, minor child. And the facts came out to show that this man had taken this young child into uh, Clackamas County and to Multnomah County and, uh, uh, pre and, and, and provided that child for sex exploitation by other men in, in those counties. And so uh, I was able to learn about some of the bars that are downtown in Portland, Oregon, uh, that are bars for minors only, and how they provide access for predators who are out in our local community. And so. It, uh, it did very much open my eyes to the problem we have here locally, and I know we're going to have some guest speakers also that will be speaking to that particular issue. So that's kind of what I wanted to say about my experience uh, here locally and over in Indonesia, and if anybody has any questions, I will try to answer them. I don't know that I can. If not, I'll just step down and continue with the program. Proud that gives a chance to make it there. Oh, okay. I'm uh, Bill Kroger, forum member. Thank you for coming today. Uh, has any studies been done about what happens to people after they become being sex slaves? Not the ones that are saved or rescued, but you know, just when their usefulness is no longer valid. Do they get killed or do they just go off and start to death? What happens? That is really a great question, and I have a partial answer for that. Uh, obviously, their demand goes down considerably when the older they get. And uh, Mike Mercer's organization, Compassion First, found out about a, an area in uh, the southeastern corner of Java, and the town is called Surabaya. And in, in that town, there is a cemetery, a huge cemetery, where all of the, a lot of the former sex. Uh, uh, slaves go and they offer their bodies there for sex in that cemetery grounds and so that's what happened, has happened to a lot of them. Uh, Mike Mercer is uh, hoping to start uh, or 
uh, to establish a shelter home there just to protect uh, some of these ladies that are involved who, who are no longer useful to the in the young sex trade, but uh, that's where they, it's, it's, it's ironic that they would be going to a cemetery and uh, offering their services down there. Yeah. Thank you, Judge. Chris Leslie, foreign member. Uh, Indonesia is now one of the world's richest countries. It has uh, huge supplies of oil. And is there anything like legal prostitution in Indonesia? And I know children is terrible, but the idea of some outlet for some of these people. Uh, yeah, that's uh, yeah, Indonesia is uh, becoming a very wealthy country. Although there is a huge gap, you know, you have the rich and then the very poor. Uh, I remember when, I, when we were in Jakarta, we uh, went over to a, a, a wealthy area of town and. Uh, I mean, the homes, there were homes as big as the spaghetti factory here that, you know, that people had built uh, in, in subdivisions there. But uh, uh, the laws in Indonesia are very similar. They have a constitution, and their laws are very similar to the laws we have here in the United States. I don't know specifically, I'm, sh I'm sure they must have a law involving prostitution, you know, of people of... Uh, who are over, you know, overage, that there's a prohibition against that, but uh, I'm not specifically aware of that. We were only dealing with the young kids that were over there. Uh, but their laws are very similar uh, to the ones here in the United States. Uh, I know that the range of time in prison uh, for being, being found guilty of child sex trafficking goes from three years to 16 years. Now, the case I talked about uh, where I had uh, the trial with the individual who was more or less trafficking the minor child. Uh, the jury found him guilty, and I had the honor and privilege to send him to prison for 25 years. Good morning. Marilyn McWilliams, I'm a forum member. And I wanted to ask you, you've had years on the bench here in Oregon, and is this a new problem, or has this kind of been undercover for many, many years? My, my guess is, I think it's been undercover for many years, and it's just recently been brought to our attention. So, yeah. Thank you. Okay, I'll sit down. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the story. Um, the, 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 the problem here on the continent is essentially that the uh, sex trafficking um, um, north-south uh, to Mexico and South America. Uh, have you um, seen any statistics or, uh, or heard any information regarding how that trade is trying to be um, dealt with in this country? Uh, no, I haven't. You know, but uh, Amanda Marshall, the U.S. attorney, uh, is uh, she has really gotten a hold of this issue, and I don't know if, uh, I mean, there have been several articles in the, the Oregonian about her, but uh, before she came on as the U.S. attorney, there was one uh, uh, assistant U.S. attorney that was assigned to child sex trafficking, or actually it's called TIP, trafficking in persons. There was one uh, U.S. attorney assigned to that job. She actually has enlarged that to three attorneys, and uh, I know the Portland police are really, really happy about uh, uh, her willingness to take on on cases. So there is a you know more of an effort uh, through the uh, the federal uh, uh, U.S. Attorney's Office to to uh, charge people. Yes, ma'am. Patricia Meadery, board member. Um, at your conference um, overseas, was there any conversation about um, the problem advancing with the advent of worldwide use of uh, internet and that make it more difficult now considering how easy it is to communicate information? Uh, there was not a specific session on that. I mean it really is, it really is, has made it a lot more, uh, a lot easier to, to do. Uh, no question about that. Uh, you know one of the things in Indonesia too is I had a chance to visit one of their prisons in Manado and you know uh, and I also have been to a couple of prisons in the United States and you don't want to go to prison in Indonesia, so it, uh, so that, that 13 to 16 years could be like 6 to 32 years here in the United States. It, it's not a very nice place to be. Um, and unfortunately, uh, money talks in, in Indonesia, probably a lot with other uh, 
southeastern kind of south, you know, um, yeah, Southeast Asia countries, and uh, uh, even though you may get a prison sentence, uh, sometimes you can buy your way out of that and get weekend passes. And the two people I met in prison in Manado, both of them were former government government workers. Corruption is a big crime in Indonesia. Uh, one of the ladies that I saw, I thought she was one of the workers there at the uh, prison, and she said, oh no, I'm getting out in three months. And I said, well, who are you, what you do? And she said, oh, I committed uh, corruption, and I've got three months to go. I was a state legislator. So, and the other man that I met, he showed me a cell, which was a you know very tiny cell, and he had it, he had it, uh, it was nice, it was neat and clean, and uh, he was 71 or 72 years older, and he used to work for the governor. He was like third assistant or something like that, so. Okay, thanks. You know, it's kind of funny, some people are fairly self-effacing. We got a speaker here earlier that spent 40 minutes talking about the procedural um, aspects of the division of power within his subsection of government. And, and Judge Cole, who was adverse to making statements that he can't back up, limited his um, presentation to strictly the facts. I think we're hoping to be a little bit more salacious, but uh, thank you. We'll give a chance for questions. Um, we've got Win Wakilla here um, and uh, Mr. Justice, and they're going to double team the program, as I understand it. Um, again, I try not to, to provide much of a description of the individuals, I leave it to themselves. But you actually have 30 minutes if you want to spend it one way or the other. Thank you for your interest in this subject. I gotta tell you, Doug Justice is one of my heroes and I am so excited that he's able to come here today to speak with you. Um, Doug had Mike Geiger's job before Mike. He also coordinated and organized a Western States Vice Conference that the main subject was human trafficking, sex trafficking. He's also helped teach the classes down at University of Oregon on human trafficking, and he's been a speaker for me whenever I needed him, and he, and he is definitely one of my heroes. Actually, too, if you go to Dan Rather's HDNet TV, um, Dan Rather's group decided to call this video Pornland instead of Portland after uh, coming here. But you can download, download that for $1.99 and it gives you a really good idea of what's going on. Um, I have an organization called FAST. I used to be executive director for Oregonians Against Trafficking Humans and then I decided to do some political things, as you guys know. And uh, so I started my own organization called FAST, which stands for Fight Against Sex Trafficking and also Fight Against Slavery Slash Trafficking. There's some cards on the table. I'm also helping uh, call to rescue it, and they are having a fundraiser May 18th, and whoever emails me first about it, I will buy your ticket. It's $50 to their fundraiser, and they're having actor Miguel Nunez come as one of the main speakers. I do want to let you know, Doug's going to talk about what's going on in this area, but sometimes we think out here in Washington County that nothing would happen out here, and I was informed and passed the word on about a girl who was meeting her tricks at Albertsons on 185th and Western Union. And then she would go over to the Max and take it in to Lloyd Center and give the money to her boyfriend. And she was just graduated from the eighth grade, was gonna be a freshman. And I'm very excited now to, oh, also I'll just tell you real fast, if you do email me, um, I try to work like a chamber of commerce for all the different organizations in our area, and we're very fortunate. Um, there are at least about 15 really good organizations here fighting sex trafficking, and um, I send out a newsletter just twice a month that has all the upcoming activities that all the different organizations have going on. And I'm in my fifth year of putting free events on at Kells Irish Pub that are free and open to everybody. My next one will be May 28th, and I have Northwest Life Works coming to speak. And also, I don't know if you knew, Nicholas Kristoff was recently at Reed College, and a group called the Reedies students got him to come speak. 
So I'm having them come talk about their experience with Nick, Nicholas Kristoff, too. And I'm very excited now to introduce you now to Doug Justice, a really good friend of mine who has been a hero of mine for a long time. Thank you. I'm a retired Sergeant Doug Justice, and uh, the last four years of my police career, I did almost 30 years, was working human trafficking. And to say it's been around a long time, it's definitely been around a long time, and no one was dealing with it. I mean, when I interviewed for the job as a sergeant in charge of human trafficking vice, my only prostitution arrest turned out to be a guy. I mean, so I was really bad at it. I mean, I didn't know anything about it. I, we kind of avoided it because once you picked up one of these little girls, you were stuck with her for hours. There was no place to put her. No one wanted to take her. They would lie to you. They would cuss at you, spit on you. Um, and everybody treated them like throwaway. But mainly there were adults back then, for very fewer kids. But when I got the job, and my two investigators were telling me that the DA's office is not taking our cases. And I'm thinking, well, that's, that's silly. You know, why wouldn't they take them? Well, it's because they didn't know anything about it. They didn't know how to deal with it. They didn't want to deal with it because you got to put this kid on the stand now. you got to teach this kid how to testify. And they're going to tear her to shreds on the stand because she's a prostitute. She's a criminal. That's the first thing they said. So when I took over this job, it was a complete change. You had to rethink everything. I had to teach the DAs how to handle the case. I got to send them to training. I sent myself to training. I sent my investigators to training. It was a complete awakening, learning, relearning. Everything you thought about police work was changed. Because these little girls are like caged animals. They've been abused their entire lives. 95% of our girls were sexually abused. At least 95% had been sexually abused by their parents, foster parents, grandmas, whoever had abused these kids. And then you take that child and you put it in a professional pimp manipulator who convinces them to do everything. Things you would never imagine to do, these kids do it 25 to 30 times a day, right? And then you find them and you get them away from them, that person. And now you try to get them to tell you what happened to trust you, not trust this guy that's been controlling their lives for how many months or years. It's unbelievably hard to do. So we started that process and we started getting success. I had two great investigators. I had Megan Burkeen, who still does it, and Laura Wiley. They were really dedicated, hardworking investigators. But what you found out was you'd get these kids kicking and screaming, literally. You would take them out of a hotel room kicking and screaming, biting you. Then you try to convince them that you need to testify, you need to do the right thing. And then you get them to that point, and because there's no shelters in the state of Oregon, you would put them in a foster home, and then they would run away. And as the judge would know, that is your evidence. Like if I arrested you for some drugs, I could take that drug and put it in an evidence locker, and I have it, when we went to the judge's chambers, I can find you guilty. When this little 13 year old girl runs away and we gotta go to court, and the judge goes, where's your victim? We don't have one. Your case is thrown out. And this is what we, we dealt with constantly, constantly. And like he mentioned earlier, there was one federal prosecutor who did all of our cases. He was pretty new at it, like everybody else was at it. He really didn't know what to do. He was going through the training too to try to figure it out. So we got a task force together, and, and you got to remember, anything in the government, the judge knows this, when you've been in the government, to get something to change in the government is humongous. To get them to believe in it is, is really a step, because that's just how they've done it their whole career. Why would they change it now? So every time you did this was a hurdle. You stepped on some toes. People got upset. People didn't like what you were doing. Then they finally realized, oh, yeah, that was a good idea. So we got that, we started to get some things prosecuted, but our whole thing was these little girls. Um, she mentioned that show that Dan Rather did. The, the reason he did that is because in 2009, we did a, a joint effort with the FBI called Operation Cross Country, where we would set up and, and have kids come to our room, you know, prostitutes. And we were the number one city in the United States 
for rescued juveniles. We beat out Los Angeles, Miami, Las Vegas. That's not a good thing to beat out, right? Well, we're rescuing 12, 13, 14, 15 year old girls in the city of Portland. In one night. In one night. And we only did it one night, and the other cities did it two nights, and we rescued more kids. So obviously there's a problem. Well, Mr. Rather, producer, sees this and does a show. And he came to Portland to do the show and was just appalled that this was happening in our city. And like everybody else was, we didn't know. We, no one knew this was really going on. It was, it was under the scenes, right? Well, he does the show, and normally his shows are 30 minutes. He, his only show was ever done, this was an hour show because there was so much to show and so much to talk about about this, about Portland. So we did the show, and it was one of the top shows he ever did, apparently, all kinds of stuff. But what it did, it brought bad light to Portland. And being that I was the guy that was on the show, <laughs> brought bad light on me. So um, it kind of made things really difficult for the last couple bits of my career there because he called it Pornland. I, didn't, I did not call it Portland. He did it. But it, it, the city council and the chief's office didn't really like that show being aired. So I retired. But anyway, I'm just saying. <laughs> um, this, I did 30 years as a cop. Hardest job I ever did was this job. Because, you know, you're taught to, as a cop, you have this veil in front of your face. And you can look at a kid and, and just blow them off if you have, you know, you can just say, this, we're going to try our best, and if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. You look at these kids who have been abused their entire little life. And I'm talking abuse that you wouldn't do to a dog. And they, these are our kids right here in the United States. So you go to bat for them. You fight for them. When they're, when they're throwing them back to a foster home, you're arguing with CSD going, why aren't you helping this kid? Why aren't you doing that? This is not a piece of meat, this is a child. So you put your heart and soul into it. And it takes a toll because you get these little kids. I have three that if you watch that show with Dan Rather, all three, I still keep in contact with their parents. I still find out how they're doing. Um, one little girl that's in the show just had a baby. She was prostituting in LA. Her mom got her back, got a three bedroom apartment to help raise the baby, did, got her into school, got her into counseling, everything was going great. Two days ago, she just ran away with the baby. This is, it never stops. Uh, of the three girls who are on that show, one girl has a job, is working, her parents have really put a lot of energy and money into counseling. The other little girl had a baby at 12, and she had a baby at 16. She's in a locked facility now with that small child. Megan still goes and sees her. I can contact with them. You, you become attached to these kids. Um, one little girl that was 16 brought to Portland and uh, by a really, really vicious man. Um, I convinced her to testify against the guy. Unfortunately, the case sat in the federal prosecutor's office for over a year before it went to grand jury. We went to grand jury. She testified brilliantly on the stand in grand jury. Uh, indicted him, and uh, that was April 28th, May 9th. Uh, she disappeared, and have never we never found her or her body. Um, her mom lives with that every day. I live with that every day because I'm the guy that sat in her living room and told her, "Trust me, do the right thing. Testify, I'll take care of you." And what we've been told is that they killed her because she testified in federal court. Amanda Marshall, thank God, took over. She's changed that whole thing. That'll never happen again, I'm sure. But um, you delay a kid like that, you put her back out on the street somewhere, and, and this bad man man is not in custody, bad things are going to happen. So I have to live with that one. Uh, I, I talked to her mom. I, I've gone to every vigil since on May 9th. I go up there every year and throw flowers into this little pond by our house. Um, it is, like I said, the toughest job I ever did. I'm, I'm the most proud of what I did because I really do believe I brought to light stuff 
that everybody else didn't want to see. It cost me dearly, uh, uh, but I did it, and I would do the same thing tomorrow if it happened again. I did four years of nonstop arguing and trying to get people to listen, and when you do that, unfortunately, people get a little upset. So. I can, I can tell you, too, this doesn't just happen to girls who have a up, bad upbringing. Yeah. Um, we had, I, one of the trainings I went to, I ran into a girl, her father was a pastor in Portland. At her high school, she was very shy, withdrawn, had a friend who was the same way, and then two fun girls came to her school. And she ended up hanging out with them, and when she graduated at the end of that, you know, the first of the summer, they convinced her, and her parents agreed, for her to go with them to work in Florida for the summer. It turned out she was prostituted. They would allow her to call her parents, but they were right there any time she was on the cell phone. And it was uh, 10 years later, she was finally able to tell her parents what really happened. She was so embarrassed. Yeah. And they do take this on like it's their, their fault. Yeah, they, they basically, the, the pimp, convinces them that they're the criminal, they're the one committing the illegal acts, he's not doing anything. If the police come, they're going to arrest her, not him. And that if they, if they try to run back, they're going to tell their parents, their teacher, their, their minister, that she's a prostitute. They'll tell their whole family. We've had them say, we're going to kill your little brother, we know where you live, we'll find you, we'll kill your little brother. One of our little girls that was able to get out, that Megan and I worked with and worked with. She uh, finally got away from her pimp, and he came to her house, talked his way in, knocked her down, started choking her uh, with a cord. She was able to kick him off. She dialed 911 really quickly. He uh, kicked her and broke her ribs, so now her lungs are filling up. He drags her to the basement and tells her, when your dad gets home at 4 o'clock tonight, he'll find you dead in the basement. Uh, thank God that the call went out. Um, she heard a knock on the door, she ran upstairs, and, and uh, the police were there, and they put him in prison for like nine years. But they, they control these little girls so bad, and this little girl, both parents worked, great household, her grandma had died, who was her closest person, and just set her in a little spin, here was this guy waiting in the wings in high school to be her best buddy and take care of her, and she was pulling tricks at night and going to school during the day. You watch that show she talks about it but I mean and this is constant every day you run into little girls I mean 13 14 years old 15 in Portland and around uh, that same kind of thing something bad happened or they had been abused by a relative someplace and it never really was gotten out of her and here come, along comes this guy that wants to be her savior will take care of every little problem and man immediately she's at some hotel in downtown Portland turning tricks. So, and, and like I, right now I'm working as a, in Battleground as a work crew chief for little violators. One of the high school girls who was there for MIP was telling me yesterday, she goes to Prairie High School. There's a girl in her high school, who's a senior, is in Vegas right now with a pimp, and her parents don't know it. And she's, because she's too afraid to tell them. So. I'll, I'll have Doug tell you real fast too, the process the pimps go through to lure these girls in? Well, it, it's, it, it's quite a process. I mean, they, they become their buddy. They, they, they sell them this line. These guys could sell cars to, to anybody. I mean, really, they're really good at their job. They, they, they break them in, they break them in, break them in. They, they buy them all this stuff. They treat them like gold, get their hair done, their nails done, buy them new clothes, take them out to dinner, and then they go, I've done all this for you. What are you going to do for me? Money doesn't grow on trees. You can make a lot of money doing this, and then they, and they also they have a lot of sex with them. They have their buddies have sex with them, and then they tell them, "Hey, look, you had sex with those guys for free. You could you could make a hundred dollars a guy. We could make a thousand dollars a day." And they just break them down so bad that they do it. You wouldn't think they would. Like I, I've said this a million times. If you'd have told me when I was going to be that sergeant that a little girl would be at Lloyd Center. And some guy would walk up to her within three hours to have her turning tricks on 82nd Avenue, I would say, you're crazy. And they do it all the time. <clears throat> Seriously. 
I just gotta, like that. I gotta tell you too, there's another thing on your table that has to do with pornography. And I know pornography is an adult choice, but just like gambling or drugs or alcohol, it can be addictive. And some of these girls, besides being prostituted, they're also put in pornography. And they, they the understanding is that probably about 85% of pornography is sex trafficking victims. If you figure they're under the age of 18 already, they're a sex trafficking victim. And the problem with any kind of addiction is once you get used to a certain level, you need to go beyond that. And then you get into either violent or younger. And uh, I don't know if you saw the last testament of Ted Bundy before he was killed. And he said that pornography is what got him going into the cycle that he was in. Someone asked a question earlier about what happens when the girls get older. One of our missions we did, we had a 42-year-old woman. I was the John in the hotel, and she showed up, and we arrested her. 42, still out being a prostitute. She started when she was 14, because I was interviewing her. And she said, I go, how did you ever get started? And she goes, well, my grandpa was raping me every day. So I ran away. I figured I might as well make money if my grandpa's going to rape me. I might as well get paid for it. She was 14. And then she was 42 when we picked her up. So she's been doing this all these years. If I will let ask questions or... Yeah. Do you guys have some questions to ask? Well, I know quite a few um, survivor stories through what I've been doing. I know a lot of survivors. Um, one girl, there is a trap going up and down I-5. And one girl was trafficked clear over to Hawaii as part of her route. And the people that purchased her, it turned out instead it was a gang type rape thing. And they beat her up and handcuffed her and put her in, a, or not handcuffed her, but tied her up and put her in a closet. And when she came to, she didn't hear any noise. So she literally ran through Waikiki area totally naked. And nobody even stopped her. Nobody offered to even help. So that's, that's when she decided she knew she needed to get out of it because she could be killed. But she had, um, had a, her dad had died and then an uncle and she had just gone through some really hard times. She's very, very bright. And she's one of our survivors that's one of the, I think, the best speaker we have in our area. Um, you can look her up, it's Jessica Richardson. And she has a good website. And she started an organization now called Freedom's Breath where they help survivors heal through doing artwork. I'm Bill Kroger, board member. Thank, thanks for coming. Uh, where, where do these uh, uh, pimps get their customers? Uh, they get them at elementary schools, junior high, high schools. Food. Customers. I met oh. the, the men. Oh, they, they're from Hillsboro, Vancouver. You can't believe, I mean, they're, they're from every, every walk of life. When we did a mission, and Megan Burkeen was our, our undercover officer, and we, we picked the Hilton Hotel downtown, we had a police officer from uh, out here, sergeant. We had a uh, big executive from Nike. We had a giant businessman from downtown Portland. Um, we had truck drivers. We had everybody come in. Um, it's anybody and everybody. Uh, it's, it's, it's an epidemic as far as the sex thing, and they don't seem to care. I mean, when Megan wrote the warrant on the big family of strip joints over in Portland, and we were stopping guys leaving there, they were, they, we, had, we stopped a minister from Vancouver, a couple big businessmen, they were freely telling you what kind of sex they just had at that strip joint, telling you all about it. Um, yeah, it's, it's just an eye-opener. And, and talking about money, I know that the international stuff has a lot of money. When we raided those houses, the owners of this strip joint, just in cash, in their bedrooms, in shoeboxes, okay, $800,000 in three houses. That's not including their bank accounts. That's not including what we didn't find. Their ATMs alone, just through their ATMs at their strip joints, was $9 million a year. So there's a lot of money in this. And they one little girl, minimum seven hundred to a thousand dollars a day, seven days a week. Your overhead is a hotel, some crummy clothes, and some cheap food. 
and they find too that um, there's probably somewhere between 150 <coughs> and 300,000 domestic people involved in this kids. So those that, that's how many people are are runaways, and they figure probably about half or so, somewhere around there, probably get into this. So it's a in Portland there. One of our problems is that uh, I worked for both Portland Police and Washington County Sheriff's Office, not as an officer, but I worked there. And there are no statistics for how many, how many human trafficking calls we have. It's not a call for service. But we do have, um, we know in Portland area, they have 125 to 50 cases usually. But those are just girls that they have identified and they feel there's a lot more than that. Can you talk a little bit? Yeah, in fact, uh, Mike Geiger is the one that started this statistic where, because everything's falling through the cracks, he started a program where if um, JDH gets an intake person, a little girl comes in, and they ask, they have a series of questions they have to ask now about prostitution and stuff. And if they answer three or four, well, I don't remember the name of how many it was there, they automatically get referred to us and we give a case number. Even though if we don't even investigate it, it gets a case number to show this little girl had mentioned the fact that she had been approached or attempted to be forced into prostitution. And so there should be some better stats. And that, that was, I left in 2011, so I'm sure there's some stats on that now. Um, this it may already, already be going on, but is, are there any programs going to the schools in, in middle school or in higher grades in grade school, since you're talking about very small youngsters about obviously this problem and offering them resources or ways to get out of the situation before the pimps um, approach them. Um, that is something we need help with. And on, on your table, the pornography piece is put out by AWARE, and AWARE has actually been gone through a process over in Washington and is approved to have their programs in their schools. Um, we have done some outreach training, including Doug has too quite a bit, in schools that will ask. And but it's hard. And we, I've started clubs in different schools and middle schools. But it's hard to get into the schools. A lot of times the parents are like, "Ooh, we don't want to talk about sex," and the teachers and the principals kind of follow that. I'll let Doug talk a little bit about that. We uh, we weren't allowed in the Portland Public Schools. Uh, we could teach the janitors the social workers, the, the, the cafeteria workers, the secretaries, and we couldn't teach the kids. We weren't allowed in. They said they don't, that's, that's too harsh of a topic to deal with, which, guess where your kids come from? <laughs> that's where they're recruiting your children, and we weren't allowed in there. I, I might have changed now. I don't know. I, I retired in 11. We did, we did teach the, the colleges. We spoke at a lot of colleges, but not the high schools or junior highs, where we should have been, actually. I did help put on a presentation at Centennial High School and Lake Oswego High School and, and OES and Jesuit. I think we had one at Jesuit High School too. So if anybody is on your PTA and you would like to help push for something to come to your school, and it doesn't have to be during school hours, um, I would love to help get that going. John Leeper Forum member, I want to commend both of you as well as the good judge for all of your good work on this. My question is, so Dan Rather gave this program on Portland. I think really that's commendable for the Portland area to have done it, even though there are some who don't care for what we did. But my concern is, what if anything is being done in other, I don't care whether we're talking about West Coast, Midwest, or East Coast, but it, it is something that is a problem that is much bigger than Portland. It just looks like we're trying to do something about it. What are these other metropolitan areas doing or not doing? Well, I, I know that uh, Senator Ron Wyden uh, took a real interest in this. and In fact, I flew back and testified in the Senate oh, about a year or so ago on his bill that would uh, it would give, uh, I forget how many millions of dollars for education, for resources, for the victims, for safe houses, and for training police officers because, trust me, cops don't know this. I didn't know this, and I was a cop a long time. 
You have to be trained on what to observe, what to look for, how to talk to these kids. Senator White has a great bill. A bunch of us went down and testified in Washington, D.C., but it always gets stalled uh, because somebody doesn't like Senator White or whatever, you know how that politics stuff works. So, but there is a lot of information out there. A lot of cities are working on this. The, the federal government's on top of it. The Center for Missing and Exporting Children is all about this. They have great resources through there. It's really, really come alive. There's some big time movie stars now that are involved in this. Um, I spoke in New York with um, Ashley Judd uh, on this topic at this big theater place there. And then um, Marina Savino, I think her name is. She's uh, really big into it now. So it's, it's more and more is getting out there. And the whole secret to this whole thing is educating. Educating you, educating the kid, your children, educating students at the schools, educating the court system, the police officers, nurses. everybody, yeah. nurses. I mean, that's who sees it. The schools, the cafeteria workers, the, the health care worker, uh, you know, the janitor, who's, this is my whole thing. It's the kid that's sitting in that corner eating a lunch by herself that you and I should be going over and talking to because if we don't, the pimp will. Guaranteed. That's who they look for. They don't look for the most beautiful girl who's popular. They want that girl that's dragging her backpack home, that just broke up with her boyfriend, that her parents just had her made her mad because she didn't make her bed. I mean, they want that child that's down on herself, the one that's sitting by herself at that cafeteria, sitting by herself at the food court. That's who they're going to target. And that's as, as citizens, as teachers, as bankers, or whatever. That's the kid that we need to go help, right? We need to go talk to that kid. And I, I'm working part-time at the Vancouver School District now, and whenever I'm on a campus, I purposely find that child. They're sitting behind a pillar upstairs at Skyview High School. I go talk to that kid. I get her name, I shake her hand, I introduce myself. Here's just who I am. If you need anybody to talk to, you can come talk to me. If we did that more and more, less kids would get sucked into this because they have someone to go talk to. I've got to add, too, that I've, I've had the privilege of meeting with uh, people from other countries through the World Affairs Council, and we would talk, we would get groups together with the police and the district attorney's office and different organizations and talk to them about human trafficking. And I think it was a group from India that told us, uh, they'll hit major cities around the United States, and they said, we are doing more here in our area than anywhere else in the United States. And some of the big cities they've been to, like, D.C. and Baltimore and didn't even think they had a problem. Marilyn McWilliams again. I have to ask, it seems to me that if we address this problem just in terms of the victims, we'll never solve it. That the, the people who are really the perpetrators are the pimps and the johns, and then the people who are, are spending money on pornography are really feeding this whole process. Yet in this country, it seems to be a, just, you know, that's just good old boys, and that's just what guys do, and so on. Are there any churches or any institutions that are really trying to make people realize that it's not a good thing to be a John? It's not a good thing to, uh, to use pornography. We're very fortunate, people, like I said, aware program has a brochure on your table, and that is part of what they try to do, and there are quite a few we're lucky in this area, we probably have like 12 to 15 organizations that are involved in this. We have a group of men who are mentoring other men. Um, it's called EPIC, E-P-I-K. And they're trying to get groups of 100 men who will get together and make other men more aware of what's of this problem and actually do fundraising too to help the victims and whatnot. So we're very fortunate that there are things going on here and I'm sure Doug can tell you more too. Well, right before I left, um, the DA now, Greg Moad left, and then the DA that just took yeah. over, JR, started the John's class and he... he Multnomah County. Yeah, Multnomah County. He, he uh, took it over at like a San Francisco one that was very, real successful. And so that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to get the Johns to be and then they bring in the little girls who stand in front of them and say, this is what you did to me. This is how you made me feel. This is the therapy I'm in because of what you did to me. And that's huge. And they started at Multnomah County, and I know JR has been real successful. He's a 
He's a great DA, hard worker. He took this to heart, kind of like I did. He got the, the compassion and passion and saw it and did it. So. Chris Leslie again. Uh, from my experience in knowing and growing up with police officers, uh, a lot of this was uh, runaways being picked up by the pimps at bus stations. Uh, and now we have the kidnapping of young children in various cities throughout the country. How do you address that? Well, the runaways is a huge deal. You know, Portland is a huge runaway city. I mean, look at the transient population and they have all the homes they have. Our runaway is huge. We have kids coming from all over the United States to run away in the world. How they do it, I don't know, but they're all here. That's a huge problem. And there's a detective in Texas, Fawcett, I think his last name was, and he did a study in Texas. If you were a runaway, I forget how many times, three or four times, and were delinquent in school and suffered bad grades in school, he had a little, he called it the Fawcett Funnel or something like that. If you had three runaways, two truancies, and whatever, 98% you're, you were going to be in prostitution. It was an amazing statistic that he had put together on the runaway, just like you said. And how they, you know, how many years? They didn't even file runaway reports for the longest time on little kids, you know, unless they were really little. If they, well, I know, but I'm saying they didn't do it. I mean, I remember when I was up there, we had to force them to take a runaway report. Come on, guys, we've got to get this in the system because it happens so fast now. It's not like they're going to be in Washington County. They're going to be in Vegas mm -hmm. the next day. So it's, it's all sped up. And the Internet, someone asked earlier about the Internet. It just changed the whole dynamics of this thing. It, it used to be a phone call, or you had to drive down a street and then make eye contact and go a little circle on the block. You can go like this. Well, there's one right there. Go on Craigslist, go on Backpage, any of those things nowadays. You can. There's hundreds of girls for sale every time you turn that thing on. Hundreds. So. I know you got to go, so... As I say, uh, Beaverton School District, a couple years ago, had 1,500 homeless kids that were enrolled. It's even more now. So who knows how many more aren't enrolled. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, thank you. I'll buy you a $50 ticket for the Call to Rescue banquet, whoever emails me first. And it's uh, May 18th in the evening with actor Miguel Nunez. I'm just editorially note. My father was an attorney. I'm an attorney. Um, about 35 years ago, this DA's offices couldn't prosecute rape cases, especially child rape cases. They had horrible success rates on those. Um, and a deputy district, a district attorney down in Marion County, uh, Chris Van Dyke, was one of the first folks in his work to, to develop some of the techniques. And right now, child sex cases and um, Rape cases are generally incredibly hard.